Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us for the Science Showcase. And uh, we're delighted to have a focus tonight on uh, some of our Scripps faculty who have been, uh, whose expertise uh, allows them to really make substantial contributions uh, to science around the COVID pandemic. And we're going to hear first from Jack Gilbert, who is a professor of oceanography and uh, also a uh, uh, a professor in pediatrics. So it's a, a joint appointment between health science and, and Scripps. And he joined us in January of 2019. Uh, Jack got his PhD from Unilever and Nottingham University in the UK, uh, did a postdoc in Canada at Queen's University. And then he was a senior scientist at Plymouth Marine Lab in UK. Uh, at that point, he left and came to the States uh, where he was at Argonne National Laboratory and a professor of surgery and director of the Microbiome Center at University of Chicago. Uh, then in 2019, moved here. Uh, and he is, uh, he co-founded the Earth Microbiome Program. So looking at uh, the microbiome of, of uh, the rest of the, the living things uh, on the planet besides humans, as well as the American Gut Project. Uh, he is a prolific uh, author uh, and, and um, is, has been recognized as a real mover and shaker in many ways. For example, Crane's Business in Chicago uh, listed him as one of its 40 under 40. And in 2015, he was listed as one of the 50 most influential scientists in the US by Business Insider. Uh, and uh, just another one of those interesting things in uh, uh, 2017, he co-authored uh, the book, Dirt is Good. Uh, and it's a popular science guide to the microbiome and children's health. So with that sort of peripatetic uh, introduction, Jack, over to you. Thank you, Margaret. I, I'm also no longer under under 40, which sucks, but um, it's all good. I'm, I'm growing with wisdom and age, I hope. Um, so uh, today I'm going to just present a quick overview of our um, sewage related activities on campus that enable us to um, understand the, um, the distribution of SARS-CoV-2 across building structures and give you a slight update on that. And then I did want to present some really exciting work that we've been doing in the hospitals uh, here on campus to um, understand the relationship between microbiomes, the bacteria inside our bodies, and uh, the spread of uh, SARS-CoV-2. So I'm going to start um, uh, uh, with this. Um, we have uh, um, started this Return to Learn program about six, seven months ago um, in order to try and understand ways of um, managing and manipulating uh, the data associated with SARS-CoV-2 presence, persistence on campus. Um, risk mitigation, viral detection and intervention are the three pillars um, and the prospective ideology is they have to be interdependent and adaptive. Um, so I'm gonna move through this fairly quickly, but happy to share the slides as necessary. Um, uh, UCSC San Diego campus um, has a numerous number of wastewater monitors that have been put in place. It's predominantly led by um, a Professor Rob Knight's group up in engineering and pediatrics. Um, we started the term with six samplers. Now we have 52 samplers as of the end of November, um, and uh, they cover approximately 120 buildings. Uh, we should have SIO covered for at least six buildings as of the end of this week, um, and then uh, hopefully fully covered by the end of next week. Um, and we're ramping up um, uh, over the winter, winter quarter to hit uh, over 200 buildings. I think it's now 260 buildings on campus. Um, sewage sample, we, we take a, a sewage sample literally out, um, out of our automated sewage collection devices that are placed in the manholes at the various junctions that are associated with individual buildings. And then that sample is processed, DNA uh, and RNA is extracted. Um, the RNA is purified away from the DNA um, and then we put it, put it through the RTQ-PCR assay, um, the same one as you would get if you got a nasal swab um, uh, for uh, SARS-CoV-2 detection. Um, and then we use that to quantify the number of viral particles in the sewage. Um, uh, the, uh, this is a, a Jacobs Medical Center wastewater versus daily COVID-19 census, and there is a really nice correlation. Um, it, it, as you see the Jacobs Medical Center caseload 
on the x-axis and the number of viral copies per liter um, on the, as a log on the y-axis provides a very strong correlation between those two characteristics, suggesting that what's coming out in the sewage um, is indicative of what's going on in the building. Um, we're doing this cluster randomized study with the aim to assess the impact of wastewater monitoring on detection of cases in associated residential units uh, in the campus. Um, clusters of manholes are associated with residential buildings and those are the units uh, that we randomize. Um, and then we have half clusters that receive sample as first time step and then the remainder receive sample as the second time step. And then we get an awful lot of data um, uh, highlighting the proportional, uh, the absolute abundance of SARS-CoV-2 particles and whether we they reach the threshold of detection, threshold of detection in green, um, silence in red. Um, no notification if wastewater is positive and um, known student isolating in place and known diagnosis on the same day. Otherwise, uh, with a positive wastewater sample, uh, we have a new signal, localized email to residents unless the building bathroom changes are in place, which uh, um, we get an all campus uh, notice and you'll have seen those notices in, uh, in, in boxes if you're on UCSD campus. Um, and then a repeated signal, a repeated message every three days until um, uh, the system is localized. Um, and this is, uh, we know this is uh, creating fatigue, uh, but it's incredibly important in providing resources. And we legally, uh, based on California state law, have to report it if there is a, a positive case. So that's why you sometimes get emails stipulating, yes, there's a positive case um, has been detected, but it doesn't say where. Well, we have to legally uh, present the detection, um, but where is um, uh, under confidentiality uh, agreements. Diagnose COVID-19 cases in relation to wastewater notification um, uh, uh, provides this uh, um, 49 diagnosed cases over this period. Three courses were detected through wastewater testing, um, which is uh, fantastic. So it suggests that wastewater testing is providing a significant ability to maintain detection of SARS-CoV-2. And more than half of these were tested and detected within three days of being notified, which is fantastic. So, uh, you know, we detect it in the wastewater, then we go in and survey the population and identify those individuals who are tested positive. Um, it's a highly sensitive approach. Um, it can detect a single case in an entire building. Uh, the isolation in place obscures potential infections, um, which, uh, you know, means that we can't get in and, and swab people unnecessarily. Um, upstream downstream signals can be hard to interpret, but we're working on those and, and it can, um, you know, as we get more data, we'll be able to disentangle those relationships. Um, past infections and late shedders may contribute to positive wastewater, but um, it, uh, detection, but it doesn't necessarily um, obscure um, uh, real cases that are currently ongoing at that time. Um, uh, messaging and data visualization uh, continue to be optimized. So, um, uh, in respect to that, we are uh, continually um, trying to improve our ability to detect SARS-CoV-2 on campus and operationalize uh, ways of ensuring that uh, we can get to people who are tested positive, um, isolate and um, uh, diagnose and provide them with the best treatment possible. Um, let me just uh, come into this. Um, so we've been trying to explore the ways in which uh, the microbiome of our bodies and our buildings might be influencing SARS-CoV-2 infection and there are a number of ways in which this happens. Um, as you all know hopefully now due to the pandemic we are little microbial spreading machines. Um, uh, both bacteria and viruses are continuously emitted from our body up to 30 million bacterial particles and in certain instances over 300 million viral particles can be emitted from our body every hour. Uh, the vast 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 majority of those are benign however um, uh, in susceptible instances they can cause problems. Um, and as um, uh, uh, Professor Prather will uh, talk about later, um, uh, the, the ability to uh, manage and understand that spread with inside a building and their air system is incredibly important. So, but uh, from my perspective as a microbiome scientist and as a bacterial um, uh, file, I really wanted to bring it back to the microbes and see what the microbes might be doing to um, understand and initiate these processes. So I'm very interested in transmission, and obviously transmission comes through the air, as we'll uh, hear from Kim, but it also comes through direct contact and interaction with those spaces. We know that um, uh, fomite transmission, so direct physical contact, is not a major um, spreader of SARS-CoV-2. The vast majority is through airborne contamination. Um, however, we are detecting uh, viable SARS-CoV-2 particles on surfaces, and those can be resuspended back into the air and lead to that secondary infection. So we're really interested in that transmission element um, as well. 
Um, and the SARS-CoV-2 particle has all of these wonderful little keys spread all over the surface of it, um, which provide a, um, a latch which allows it to break into the human cells in the respiratory tract um, and, uh, and cause infection. However, these, these little keys, this spike protein, uh, which is present all over the surface, um, is also a, a potential source for bacteria to link onto the, um, the virus or the virus to link onto bacterial cell membranes as well. Um, and uh, we think this might be influencing the ability of SARS-CoV-2 to persist in given environments. Um, for the vast majority of time, a, an RNA virus, when it's released into a, a dry, harsh, surface is going to uh, die pretty fast. Um, and yet there have been some evidence supporting the survival of um, SARS-CoV-2 on different substrates for longer than we would expect, such as plastic, stainless steel, and cardboard. Um, copper, obviously, we see a significant drop off very rapidly. Um, but the, these surfaces, uh, what could be leading to uh, the ability of that virus to survive on what should be an incredibly harsh environment for it? Um, and we think that bacteria may be playing a role through this potential binding. Some respiratory viruses, um, such as flu, um, can actually bind to bacteria, which enables them to more effectively infect human cells. Um, it's actually a two-way street, right? So uh, imagine this bacterial cell covered with uh, virus particles, either flu or SARS-CoV-2. Um, that uh, coats the bacteria and allows the bacteria to more effectively bind onto human cells because the SARS-CoV-2 has these wonderful little spike proteins that enable that. That can actually help the bacteria to colonize the host and can help it to penetrate cells leading to secondary infections, which are one of the predominant ways in which we see excess mortality in our cases in hospitals. Um, but also, if the uh, bacterial virus conjugate leaves the body, and ends up in the cold, harsh, dry environment of, of uh, our buildings, it's actually more likely uh, that the virus particle can survive uh, protected by its bacterial host uh, for its short duration outside of the body. So we're interested in that phenomenon. And in fact, uh, conjugation with bacteria has been shown to increase the viability of influenza viruses outside of the body. So um, uh, here uh, we have de uh, bacteria uh, plus or minus and desiccation uh, plus or minus. Um, and obviously these samples are highly desiccated versus not desiccated. In the presence of bacteria with um, no desiccation, we see a very significant uh, survival of the virus. In the absence of bacteria with desiccation, we see um, no survival of the virus. Um, uh, the uh, influenza virus. But in the presence of bacteria and desiccation, the virus can survive. Um, and uh, this, this led us to propose that the, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 program might be, the uh, virus might be doing the same thing. And uh, what we've done here is we've actually taken the spike protein um, and um, uh, created a, um, a, a synthesized variant of it and demonstrated its ability to bind to the surface of particular bacteria. So up here in A, we have um, a, uh, sorry, a, um, a, uh, a transmission uh, microscopy image, uh, and the uh, red particles are the spike protein binding to the green bacterial cells. In B, we've uh, done a nice uh, graphical representation of that, so you can actually see the spike protein binding to the outside of these bacteria. This bacteria is Streptococcus pneumoniae, uh, a common um, a pneumococcal bacterial infective agent. Um, and here you can see with the spike protein, we can actually see the uh, spike protein binding to strep pneumoniae, but also Staphylococcus aureus, uh, staph infections, Pseudomonas rugosa, which is a major infective agent um, in uh, pediatric hospitals, and Hem 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 Haemophilus influenzae, which was actually the bacteria in the 19th century they thought caused flu, but is actually a common secondary infection that comes along with flu, and also appears to bind SARS-CoV-2. Um, so along with um, our colleagues here at UCSD and colleagues over at St. Jude's Hospital, uh, I put in a proposal um, to NIID um, in uh, last uh, October, and we're waiting to hear on the, ability, uh, on the success of that to see if we can expand this research and determine if SARS-CoV-2 is a major contributor um, uh, to uh, transmission of bacterial pathogens and if the bacterial pathogens enable its transmission survival in these systems. Um, back in March, we were able, I think I've got a few more minutes, we were able to dig down deep into the hospital and actually get into um, uh, our hospital Hillcrest uh, locally prior to the hospital becoming um, uh, um, uh, 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 oh, being occupied by SARS-CoV-2 patients. Um, so uh, this is back on March 8th. 
and um, and uh, we rushed in and we set up a program uh, with one of our project scientists, Sarah Allard, on, uh, who's uh, here at SIO, um, and enabled that enabled us to get into the hospital, start sampling um, the surfaces in the hospital, such as the door handles, floors, bed rails, air vent intake, etc., um, and the healthcare workers, their nose, their nares. Uh, and a tracheal aspirate, their forehead and their stool, and then also start sampling the patient when the patient arrived in, in, in the ICU room. It was all these are ICU rooms. And then we continued daily sampling for up to uh, 14 days. Um, and then we examined post-discharge and terminal clean. And then we uh, kept on sampling when the new patients arrived. Um, and this was a group effort. Lots of people in my lab have been involved. And in Rob Knight's lab, this is uh, Pedro Belder Ferrer uh, in Rob's lab, um, and um, uh, or, uh, Lisa Marotz, uh, who's a joint postdoc between Rob and myself. And then uh, Gertrude Eckley Mensah, who's a fantastic postdoc who started in my lab in 2019. Uh, Sonia Donata, who works in um, our microbiome core uh, recharge facility. Show Kadera and Neil Gottel, who are two SIO marine biology graduate students, um, have also played a major role in helping us to facilitate this program. Um, so yeah, we can detect SARS-CoV-2 in ICU rooms, and it does show up a hell of a lot more on the floors. You can see that here, this red marker. Um, our floor samples are always more positive than, say, bed rails or countertops nearby or ventilators. Um, um, so uh, in ICU rooms and non-ICU rooms, we find SARS-CoV-2 being abundant if a patient has been there. And it is detected on floors both inside and outside the rooms, even if a SARS-CoV-2 patient hasn't been present uh, during that phase. If they were present earlier, then it persists on the floors um, in that space. Um, if this was naked RNA, it would be consumed quite rapidly on those surfaces. Um, uh, so we ex uh, hypothesize, and we have data to support that in a few cases, that um, this is partly due to SARS-CoV-2 binding to bacterial groups that have colonized that space. And the viral load is higher in the nares and the stool compared to foreheads and surfaces which uh, is, is what you'd expect, right? It's colonizing the epithelial tissues inside the respiratory tract and the gastrointestinal tract. Um, viral load decreases slightly over time, but it's detectable up to 27 days after the symptom onset of the patient um, in the nares and up to 16 days after patient admission on the floors and bed rails. So we do continually detect SARS-CoV-2 and it, is, it does maintain its persistence in that environment. There are no overarching trends in microbial diversity for SARS-CoV-2 positive versus uh, negative samples or not detected samples, can't say the negative. Um, uh, so, you know, mostly uh, microbiomes look like the surface they come from. But sample type and the particular patient uh, have a much bigger influence on the microbial composition. It, who you get your microbiome sample for is important. But SARS-CoV-2 uh, status does um, have a, uh, an effect size that's actually significant for microbiome. Um, and um, drop that up. And using the patient microbiome, we can actually detect in an area under the curve um, a positive uh, response the uh, uh, whether a patient has SARS-CoV-2 uh, RNA uh, uh, detectable in in their nares or their stool or not. So microbiome uh, appears to be able to predict with a certain degree of accuracy and specificity the uh, probability of SARS-CoV-2 infection in an individual. We also were able to identify several bacterial species which um, correlate very strongly with SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection, uh, both in the body and outside the body. And interestingly, this Rothia species, Rothia denticola, we think, um, is significantly associated with SARS-CoV-2 persistence in the environment and in the patients. Um, and we uh, are doing studies now, but it looks like it can bind the spike protein. Um, and we are collecting Rothia um, uh, uh, denticola and Rothia uh, um, uh, clinical isolates from our clinical microbiology labs across the hospitals now to determine if um, they actually do associate with SARS-CoV-2 infection in um, more cases. Rothia denticola is often associated with periodontal disease, um, and so there could be a strong link there. Um, using meta-analysis, we also showed that it's not it's associated with SARS-CoV-2 and not just with people who are sick, uh, which is an important um, uh, control. And I just want to point out that despite uh, the long-term shedding of SARS-CoV-2 into the environment by patients, no healthcare workers in our Hillcrest facility um, uh, providing patient care or collecting samples got sick. Um, and that includes Dr. Dan, who was the uh, surgical um, le um, uh, lead who helped us to make this a reality, and our, um, a wonderful um, uh, uh, clinical uh, resident who came through my lab, uh, Fahana Ali. Um, who's still working with us, who does uh, phenomenal work and is a real advocate uh, for patient care, a wonderful person. 
Um, so patients can shed the virus several weeks. Viral stability on surface is influenced by microbial and human biomass. Um, hospital standard precautions for uh, protecting our patients appear to be working um, uh, and protecting our healthcare workers especially appear to be working. We don't, didn't see a lot of transmission, but there do seem to be relationships between SARS-CoV-2 and certain bacteria on the body and on surfaces. And we do detect uh, the ability of SARS-CoV-2 to bind onto uh, certain bacterial species and therefore potentially um, uh, alter transmission potential. So I, I just want to say thank you for listening there. This is uh, my wonderful lab. I'm very happy to be here. Um, this is when we were all together um, and we've grown uh, significantly despite the um, uh, SARS-CoV-2 pandemic situation. Um, and we are continuing to repurpose our facility to aid in the return to learn program and also in um, promoting gender and uh, um, eth ethnic and racial uh, equality and equity um, throughout our campus and groups. Thank you very much. Great. Uh, thank you, Jack. Uh, we're going to uh, take just a, a couple of questions now, if you have them, uh, and then we'll go on to Kim's presentation and then allow more time for questions at the end. So if any of you have questions now, please go ahead and put them in the Q&A. And uh, if we have any, uh, uh, we'll go to them. And if not, we'll uh, we'll turn to Kim, and then you can think about all the questions uh, and have them for the end. Um, Dr. Gilbert, there is one question from Patrick Callahan who wants to know about the relationship between COVID-19 and bacteria. Does the an antibacterial hand sanitizer work well? Um, it works well for killing bacteria. Um, is the question, does it work well for, well, this is, sorry, this is actually a really important question. And one, uh, what's the what's the clinical and uh, care benefits if we understand this bacterial relationship does exist? But it doesn't mean that targeted removal of certain bacterial organisms could be effective in helping to control um, the transmissibility and potentially disease progression of these uh, of these respiratory viruses, right? So if we could say we just want to knock, we identify this patient has strep pneumonia uh, in its in, in in that patient's lung. Um, which is quite common, um, if we could give them a targeted antibiotic to remove the strep pneumonia, it might actually help them to um, have a less of a severe reaction uh, to SARS-CoV-2 and lessen the potential for transmissibility. But yes, um, I think just washing your hands in hot soapy water uh, for 20 seconds is um, uh, almost as effective as using uh, hand sanitizers, if not more effective in many cases. Um, and also um, uh, it doesn't necessarily lead to any other increases in uh, antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance in microbial organisms. Um, if you have to use one, um, I use an alcohol-based one, um, not one containing triclosan, um, and, uh, and use uh, common sense and wear a mask. <laughs> Great, thanks, Jack. So let's turn to uh, Kim Prather. Uh, she joined Scripps in 2001, but like Jack, she is not only a Scripps faculty member, but she is also a, uh, uh, a distinguished chair in atmospheric chemistry uh, in the Department of Chemistry and a distinguished professor of oceanography. And uh, Kim's work focuses on uh, aerosols and all of the ways that aerosols uh, interact with the ocean, with people, with the environment, uh, and uh, with the organisms in the environment. And so she has looked at how human emissions are, in, uh, are influencing the atmosphere, climate, and human health. Uh, she is the director of uh, an NSF center uh, funded here at, at uh, UCSD, the Center for Aerosol Impacts on the Chemistry of the Environment. So this is a great example of the, the confluence of all of these uh, uh, ways that aerosols interact with us. Uh, she is a fellow of everything. Uh, she's a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, uh, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and uh, even more significantly, she's a fellow of three national academies, uh, the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Engineering, and the National Academy of Science. And when uh, COVID happened, 
and uh, and of course we all knew that aerosols were uh, involved because it's a flu-like uh, 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 disease. And uh, Kim is an expert in aerosols. Uh, she really took a dive into understanding aerosols and COVID. And that's what she's going to talk to you about tonight, Kim. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's see. I can share my screen. Thank you for that intro. Um, and yeah, taking a dive into COVID is probably a very good description of what I have done and what I will tell you about. Not something that I uh, sort of planned, um, but it is what it is. So today, I'm gonna tonight, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, what we've been up to um, in trying to help uh, understand, as Jack alluded to. Uh, the airborne aspects of how this virus is making its way around the globe and how it's affecting our health. And as Margaret mentioned, I am the director of a, of a large uh, center that focuses on aerosols, but I had not, I have an interest of full disclosure, I was looking at viruses a little bit, but the viruses that were in the ocean, not viruses in terms of sort of those that affected your health. But that has now um, changed quite a bit, as you will see. So, this is a picture of like basically these different colors. I show this as being sort of the background of my background, which is looking at aerosols as they float around the planet. And, you know, where I got into this was in back in March, a long time ago, it seems like now. Uh, somebody asked, you know, somebody was talking about the six foot social distancing rule and said, you know, is six feet enough? Could aerosols go further than six feet? This is a picture I have in my brain of aerosols. Um, aerosols can go all the way around the planet. Um, takes about two weeks, but they can go all the way around the planet once they're in the air. So this is the disconnect between the world of atmospheric chemistry and the medical world. And I have spent the last 10 months trying to connect those two worlds. So just to give you a little bit of background, and I had to learn, kind of learn about all this uh, very quickly. Um, and I'm still sort of on the steep end of the learning curve on this, but uh, sort of how do, what, what's the view, the traditional view of how respiratory pathogens um, get in, get, you know, get into us and infect us? Uh, well, basically there's a couple of ways, um, and this is a view that's been like large, longer than a hundred years. Uh, the biggest thing that people think about is if you cough or you sneeze, you will spray these gigantic droplets that you know can basically you know fall on surfaces and you can touch them you can spray them right onto somebody but droplets has been the focus not aerosols and so traditionally the break between what's called a droplet and what's called an aerosol in terms of size is about five microns and so a big focus of what i have spent my time doing is trying to sort of say that five microns is not appropriate. Things up to 100 microns can go much further than six feet. Um, I uh, actually it was the one that had the, you know, the privilege, pleasure of, of advising Fauci on this change. This is in all medical textbooks. This has been what we call the, the droplet dogma. Um, you know, basically nobody thought about aerosols. People just thought six feet apart, you're fine. That is not true, as I will talk about now. So early on, you might remember the messaging was terrible and it's not gotten much better, but this is from the WHO, um, the global uh, word on what's happening. And they basically came out with a tweet and said, you know, March, it's not, first they said in February it was airborne. Then in March, they said it's not airborne. And this is still, you can go find this tweet. Um, and, you know, basically this is where we are. Don't wear masks, they don't work. It's not airborne. This was the messaging, wipe your surfaces. Remember, clean your surfaces. Um, we all heard that. And so, you know, it's just a lot of confusion over terminology. Um, airborne in the medical community has a very specific uh, meaning. It means that you put people in a certain sort of uh, type of room, uh, negative pressure room, you wear specific types of personal protective, uh, protective equipment, uh, sort of your, your mask is specific, the, the garb that you wear to protect yourself is specific. It has a very specific meaning. To me, you know, airborne means like waterborne or foodborne, it's in the air, right? So there was just so much confusion early on. So what we have spent a lot of time doing is over, in a nutshell overturning a hundred year old medical dogma, um, the droplet dogma. And so in May, this I've started working on this paper, I think in late March, finally it got published in May. And this was with uh, Chip Schooley, who is a uh, 
an, an infectious disease doctor here at UC San Diego, who's been a major player in the Return to Learn program, we wrote, I wrote sort of, I connected the dots uh, of how it seemed like aerosol transmission was playing a role, that it was not droplets. Things were going much further. People were spreading them, spreading this virus. It snuck around by being spread by people who are sick and don't know they're sick. They don't cough, they don't sneeze. They produce, aer you produce aerosols, you produce millions of aerosols simply by breathing and speaking. And so that's what this paper was about, was you know, the importance of wearing masks, both to protect you and to protect others. Um, you know, looking at places that you know, sort of uh, engage this attitude of how important the air is, a place like Taiwan, they've had seven deaths. There are you know, 24 million people, New York is 20 million people. Um, you know, Taiwan never locked down. They just wore masks and implemented other sort of social distancing and hand hygiene and all the things we hear about, but they never, never shut down. And it's because they had masks available to everyone. The government issued masks and this was a big difference you know, early on. All of the places that have sort of worn masks, never questioned it, have fared much better than us here in the United States. And so, you know, basically that was the point of this paper. Um, so thinking about sort of the shift in views going from traditional coughs and sneezes to an airborne focus that has more to do with speech. Thinking about aerosols as something that comes out and rather than falling to the ground like a cannonball um, in six feet, it actually can float in a room and if that room is not ventilated properly, it can build up like cigarette smoke. You've all been in rooms with people that are smoking and you can see that over time, if you have poor ventilation, um, you can actually see this cloud start to build up. And then, so basically we share the air with anyone who's in the room, regardless, six feet means nothing, basically indoors. That has been a huge message that we've been trying to get out there um, since day one. So I've done now, I think I've close to a thousand interviews on this, um, you know, basically just trying because the public messaging has been so terrible from the public health side of things, from WHO, as well as CDC, um, a group of us sort of met on, believe it or not, social media, Twitter, and we have just been endlessly Sort of getting the message out. This is John LaPook, who's the chief medical correspondent of CBS. I don't know how many shows I've done with CBS. Lindsay Marr, who's an expert at influenza virus. Um, we just basically took it upon ourselves like to get the public to understand it is airborne and this is how you can protect yourself. Um, Finally, you know, I won't go, I could spend, I've given talks that I just talk about the whole trajectory of how many crazy things happened, you know, where WHO said it was airborne, then it wasn't, CDC put up and said it's airborne, then it snuck, it went just as quietly as it went up, it disappeared, then it went back. Now it's kind of still a mess, to be honest. Um, so we wrote, we all, I was also involved in organizing a National Academy um, workshop uh, where we basically said, the problem is this crazy five micron cut. Where did that come from? You know, why, why did they put it at five microns? It turns out that if you put it at 100 microns, it actually starts to make more sense. 100 microns actually separates those aerosols from the droplets. It separates things that float versus things that fall. It also importantly separates things that you inhale versus things that you touch. So this is like a great break actually. So we proposed, let's change the definition and get it more realistic in terms of what is happening. So we published this letter at the same time, I should like within seven minutes, um, CDC knew this was coming just how she had shared it with them. CDC put out new guidelines saying, okay, it's, it's likely airborne. So all of these crazy, you know, things have gone on way different than my normal day job, but we are continuing the pressure. Uh, this is kind of the view where we stand now, you know, previous view is coughs and sneezes, talking and singing um, produces massive amounts of aerosols. The tricky part is, you know, basically most people don't even spread this virus. There are certain people that tend to shed more virus than others. And if you're the unlucky one that happens to be in an unventilated, poorly ventilated room with one of those people, You've heard of the choir, you've heard of meat packing and nursing homes where, you know, 90% of the people become infected. This is aerosols. It's not because they all touch the same surface, it's because they all breathe the same air. And so we've been just 
trying to get this point across that if we can tackle that problem and acknowledge it's airborne, then we can put in proper control and mitigation strategies to protect everyone. And it has just been, I, I don't know, a crazy situation. Um, one thing I'll note is that you hear about, you know, people, uh, AGPs, they're called aerosol generating procedures. That's when doctors put on all of their garb, their masks, their suits. They are so careful about aerosols that are generated when they, for example, intubate a patient. Turns out, once aerosol scientists got involved, there aren't that many aerosols that are produced by those procedures. There's actually more aerosols produced just by speaking. Yet we don't give doctors and healthcare workers the right protection now. We still don't. And as a result, there's a disproportionate number that are getting infected and, di and sadly dying around the world because we cannot, because it, there is this resistance to acknowledging the airborne nature of this virus. So, you know, what will change? Bottom line, I just tell people when you're indoors with someone you don't know, wear a mask. There is no so safe social distance. Contact tracing. You know, you only trace people that are within six feet. You should trace. You should look at everybody who is exposed to the same air. You know, public will finally understand why. I firmly believe that if the public is told why and understands why, it will make better choices. Confusion leads to poor choices. I think that's pretty clear. Um, you know, and finally, we'll be protecting the people that we care so much about that are working so hard for us. Um, the healthcare and frontline workers. We can finally upgrade schools. We can make better indoor air quality. I pitched this to the Biden task force recently. Um, you know, if we make clean air for schools where kids will now finally be breathing clean air, this would be huge, not just for asthma and respiratory disease, but also cognitive disorders that we've heard about for so long. So that is, I think, going to be a big investment coming out of this uh, current administration. And finally, we'll be able to create a reopening plan that is smart. You know, we'll open, we'll reduce community transmission, we can open schools, and then we can reopen things like restaurants and bars that are by far the riskiest places. Right now, we're doing everything backwards. We're doing this yo-yoing, you know, look back at 1918. It took three years for them to get through it. And we're on that path unless we start being smart and looking at places that have done it well. And there are examples that we can follow. So the do's, you know, think about this is 1918. This is kids, you know, they're having classrooms outside. This is me with a CO2 sensor. There's smart ways to figure out, you don't have to fly blind. You can measure what's in the air. We can, you can wear the proper masks. This is a CO2 sensor in a Japanese um, business meeting. You can see that everyone is wearing a mask indoors. You can put in cheap Fans. This fan costs about $40 to create. So play, people that maybe don't have as much um, money to buy a, you know, $500 air purifier can build one for about $50. Um, same with schools. Don't. This is Redfield, uh, former head of the CDC with his mask off and talking, which is the worst thing you can do. This is WHO. Again, they're six feet apart. They were immediate. What do they do? They take off their masks and talk. Face shields are terrible. Um, those just suck aerosols in. Aerosols don't care. Face shields and plexiglass barriers are designed to stop droplets. They do nothing for aerosols. Um, you know, the further you are apart from people, the better. The louder you speak, the more aerosols you create. So singing indoors, playing musical instruments indoors are no-nos right now and avoiding places with poor ventilation. So where are we now? You know, basically we've heard all of these things WHO finally snuck in this little open window, um, but they didn't say why. Again, I, I firmly believe people would like to know why. It would make more sense. CDC kind of is, is getting there. Um, I'm hopeful that they will get there more quickly soon. Um, so just quickly, I, I tweeted a few days ago. That's been, I never was never a tweeter, um, but I've become one. And I tweeted this simple tweet. This hit over, this had over a million um, impressions. And it's just basically saying COVID is airborne. And we need, there is no counter evidence to saying that it's in droplets. Yet, why are we not just saying it? The feedback I got was, was, uh, I don't know if you say humorous or sad, but you know, people just said, why are you still saying this? Of course we know this, you know, why is it not out there and, you know, being stated? And so, you know, basically, um, you know, the, a good chunk of the public knows, but there is still pretty massive confusion about this topic. You know, the public desperately needs uh, clear messaging on this. And, you know, this is, I, I gave it one of my uh, videos I did with CBS, uh, eight-year-old listened to it, 
with her mom and then went and drew this little picture about what she learned. You know, she called them COVID spitball spaceships and wear a mask and said, oh, I don't really like a mask, but that's why we wear masks. And she was perfectly happy. You know, there's been this kind of, I would say, crazy belief that if we say it's airborne, everybody's going to get scared. No, people aren't going to get scared. They're going to appreciate understanding. She also recently made this little, um, uh, you can read this little poem, um, which is dead on. It describes it in a nutshell. And so, you know, the point is, is that if an eight-year-old can understand it, you know, how are we going to, how do we get um, this simple of a message out to the rest of the public uh, so they can understand it as well? Last thing I'll just touch on, because I'm very, I think we should all be proud of the Return to Learn program. Jack touched on it a little bit. I've been heavily involved in both the Return to Learn in terms of air, cleaning our air in our classrooms and protecting students, as well as also the San Diego Unified um, reopening plan. Um, and I think we're, I honestly think UC San Diego is a leader. Um, probably in the world um, on this particular topic. Um, from a multi-prongs, we call it the Swiss cheese model. Um, you know, these are tests, you know, you can get tested as much as you want. Um, and, you know, it's free, it's easy, it takes no time, you get your results back in hours. Uh, you know, masks are required on campus. Uh, Jack talked about the sewage sampling. We have outdoor tents, which outdoors is far safer than indoors. We have ambassadors, we have 500 ambassadors that go around, I mean, the students have been phenomenal uh, in the in terms of they want to they want the school to stay open and so we've created this very what I would call a, it's kind of an interesting experiment it's a safe bubble um, this is just you can go look at the dashboard the result that sort of the uh, testing results we have are right there out front nothing's hidden um, you hear about positivity rate um, of tests and when that's high it's obviously not good this is the community positivity rate which got up you know over 14 percent in january if you look what it is for if you live on the UC San Diego campus, it's got up to about 2%, but largely it stayed below 1%. So we've created this amazing, kind of like a little town of what you could do if people just follow the recommendations and listen to what they're supposed to do. It's actually incredibly safe um, to live on our campus. So I'm rather proud of this. I think our campus should be proud of it. The leadership, Margaret's played a huge role. I mean, entire leadership has spent you know, 24 seven thinking about how to create a safe bubble. And with that, I will stop and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Kim. And Lauren is going to moderate the Q&A. Yes, thank you, Dr. Prather. One of the first questions that came in is asking about your role with Return to Learn. And if you're having discussions with campus leadership about um, how to upgrade our infrastructure to support Return to Learn, uh, I, I know you, one of your slides looked like it had some wording about ventilation. How are you advising campus about, um, about the, this area of study that you specialize in? Yeah, so the big thing is ventilation, as you say. And so again, making classrooms safe for the teacher and um, the students. So number one, um, all, as long as everybody wears masks, that drops the risk a lot and indoors they have to regardless of if they're six feet apart so that is the rule that will be the rule on campus we've also checked we've taken those little co2 sensors that i showed um they're simple they're, they're little you know they're small and we put them in and uh, rajesh gupta who's the head of um the data science institute has been working on sort of the, the max the number of air changes we need per hour it turns out you need like six air changes per hour um and so they've been working on that upgrading the filtration uh there's these specific filters you put into the hvac systems that are called the MERV 13. Um, there's certain older classrooms where you can't do that. They don't fit well, and then you get leaks, and so that's not good. So we'll put standalone um, uh, portable filtration systems. I mean, the message here, which I didn't say, and I will say it now very bluntly, is that once you acknowledge it's in the air, it's an incredibly fixable problem. It is so easy to filter out aerosols in these viruses. Um, and so that is what we're doing now. So that when we return to, when we get back into the classroom, this is the outdoors now is still where we are, but when we go back to the classroom, things will be much safer. So yes, I am helping um, with that as, as well. Yeah, another question that's kind of related to that is about, and you showed the CO2 sensor in your presentation, what are the metrics for good quality air and what does that CO2 sensor tell people if they have one in their classroom? 
Okay, so yeah, that's a great question. So basically, um, CO2, when we exhale, we breathe out um, CO2. And so outdoors, as we've learned at Scripps, Scripps is known for CO2 measurements outdoors. So outdoor concentrations right now, thanks to climate change, is about 415 ppm, Margaret, something like that. Um, and uh, so if you were just like outdoors with clean, clean, clean outdoor air, it'd be about 415 indoors. It gets higher than that when you have people breathing and sharing the air. So the number that we shoot for is we'd like that number to be less than 600 would be nice, 800 is acceptable. Um, and so you basically just use that and you wanna use it when everybody's in the room and breathing. Um, and if it gets, starts to creep above 800, you either need to you know, increase your um, ventilation or crack a window is the simplest thing you can do. Um, and then there's a few questions about masks and face shields. One person just saying, you know, if you wear the face shield with a mask, does that offer you more protection or is yep. it, does the face yep. shield do absolutely nothing? And also, no, it does. What, type of, what type of mask do you recommend? Well, that's changing on a daily basis. But, um, okay, first question, uh, the face shield is designed to block if someone were to sneeze on you or cough on you, the drop, the splatter. Um, so yeah, it works in that regard. It will stop that situation. Um, it will also protect your eyes. You know, we don't know as much about infection through the eye. We know more about it getting in your nose and your mouth. Um, but it can, you know, there are receptors in your eyes as well. And so face shields will help um, with that. Also goggles would. In terms of what kind of mask, it's, there's a lot. Um, just in the last few days, in fact, you're starting to hear more about double masks. And so what people are recommending is sort of a surgical mask with a cloth mask, which sort of seals it closer to your face. To think this new variant is not very nice. It's, it is getting through things that the other one did, the other ones did not. And so now we're starting to ramp up either N95s, um, KN95s, and then, you know, this double masking idea is becoming um, more common. Uh, and with the new leadership, change in leadership, uh, there's, they're putting into place uh, the Defense Protection Act to create more um, good masks so everybody will have access to them. Um, so there's, you know, sort of, it's a, it's a chain, ongoing thing. If people want information on this, you know, I'm happy to share links where you can go sort of learn. Um, the studies are coming out on almost a daily basis of, how masks not only protect, you know, what you're spewing out if you're inadvertently sick and don't know it, but also what you're inhaling. Um, but the bottom line is even with a mask, it's not perfect. It's better to wear a mask than to have no mask. That is definitely um, the case. Uh, and this question might be good both for you and Dr. Gilbert to answer, but the question is how much more likely is someone to get COVID from touching a contaminated surface and then their face versus breathing aerosols? Because um, we have heard so much now about full. It's less than 10%. Some people say less than 1% off the surface right now. That's the latest. So it's much more likely that you'll inhale it than you'll get it from a surface. Thank you. Um, and then how does the viral load in aerosols compare to droplets or surface contamination? Hard to say with the surface contamination. Jack can probably address that. Um, you know, the aerosols are just so much tinier, but what ends up is kind of a crazy situation. But it turns out that when you cough or you talk, you create this film and it ruptures and it actually enriches the viruses in the tiniest ones, um, just like the surface of the ocean, which is what I was studying. So it turns out that surprisingly, the tiniest ones contain a lot more, the aerosols contain a lot more than you would think just based on size alone. So that has been a big discovery um, during this pandemic. And I don't know if um, Jack wants to talk because he's been working on trying to detect it on surfaces as well as air. So I don't know if you want to comment on that, Jack. Uh, I, uh, the, the, the data that we have now is that the, the organism can um, uh, concentrate in particles associated with the floor um, and then when people walk through a room, uh, those particles are then resuspended as they walk, you know, think pig pen from the Peanuts cartoon, mm -hmm. as you walk through the room, it just sort of bubbles up again. Um, and then they breathe it back in. And so there's a, there's a big element to play in terms of understanding whether that is playing a significant role in transmission. Um, I'll just say one thing, the, the, the new variant doesn't penetrate masks. It's just the number of viral particles that you need to actually become infected 
um, is significantly smaller. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, right. you can wear a mask and feel protected against any variant that we know of. Um, thank you. The next question um, is related to the uh, sewage treatment. So this could also be a joint question. Could the virus be re-aerosolized in sewage treatment facilities or is it getting into the ocean through sewage outfalls? So I didn't talk, I almost showed a slide on this. We have a project down at Imperial Beach on this very topic. Um, and the answer is yes. Um, you know, it's in, we detect it. We have a paper that's submitted now on, we detect it in the Tijuana estuary. We also detect it a little bit in the ocean, but once it gets in the ocean, it gets diluted very quickly. Um, right now with these current rains, we're looking at the big surf with the big winds and checking to see if we see it in the air. So, but I wanna qualify this by saying we might detect the virus. In other words, we'll detect the RNA that's indicative of this virus. The bigger question is whether it will survive and it's whether it's infectious still or not. And that is something that people are still trying to understand. It seems like this virus, lucky for us, doesn't really like the sun and probably doesn't really like salt water, we hope. We hope, but um, you know, right now we're just trying to see where we detect it in the environment, and the next step will be actually to see whether it remains infectious or not. But there are quite a, you know, it is well known that other pathogens, other viruses, can be aerosolized out of um, sewage uh, wastewater treatment plants, um, and so, but very little has been looked at as far as what in terms of what gets out of the ocean into the air, and that's something that we're working on now. And Jack, what about the aerosolation of the of the sewage treatment plant? Is that something that campus is testing through their wastewater program? Um, I, I, I'm not. I don't think we are at the moment. I, um, Kim mm -hmm. would know more about that. Mm -mm. No, we're, we're not, but we're going to put up air samplers in other places because we don't want to assume anything. Um, and so we're starting to think because SAR, I think the, where this question comes from is SARS-1 the one that was the outbreak in um, Hong Kong in 2003, that was, th that infection was outdoors and it was from sewage. And, um, and so there is concern that you could get sewage in the air. And, um, you know, so that is still, I would say an open question that we are working on addressing. It's a really good question. Uh, and then there's a question that came in from the chat that's related to another air filter question. If there's a certain type of air filter for your home or small office that you recommend or use, and do these ozone machines work? No. Simple. Just simple. Just a simple like HEPA filter is the easiest. Don't get all the bells and whistles. Those actually, the ozone will actually uh, do reactions with things that are in the air and make other toxic species that you don't want to breathe. So just a simple HEPA filter very effectively will remove particles, all particles. So if they actually keep like with the wildfire smoke, we use it um, to keep our indoor air clean. If this is overall, not just this virus, but just overall having clean in indoor air is smart. And so there's all kinds. Now there's a lot more um, that are on the market, but just get a simple HEPA filter is all you need. Don't get all the fancy UV, ozone, bells and whistles. They just charge you more and they sometimes create more problems than good. Um, and then there's a question about, you know, if our only concern was to save as many lives as possible, would it be best to shut down the country again for a period of time? I mean, you talk about this problem being fixable. What, what would you recommend? This is a touchy, this, <laughs> this question gets me in trouble. Um, you know, the, the point is, is that there's, there's a couple ways to do it. And this is, I'm, I'm in the middle of a three day meeting on this very topic. There's this uh, organization called Zero COVID. And they, they believe, and they have shown that the places that have fared the best have just shut it down for like they say about five weeks. They just shut everything down, get it down to zero, what they call zero COVID. And the harder you shut it down, the faster you shut it down, the, the sooner you can get back into business. What we have been doing is not working, obviously. We keep driving it down and then, and then not quite getting it down and then opening it up again. And then it just takes off again. And that does not work. We know that. And so we've got to think about, you know, what it will take, you know, the faster you shut it down, the more you shut it down, the sooner we'll get our lives back. Because I can tell you that if we don't want to do that, look at Taiwan, 
They never shut down. They just, everybody listened to the recommendations. Nobody walked around saying it's our right to not wear a mask. They just wore masks and they did everything they were told. They increased ventilation. They learned from SARS-1. And so you can get by without shutting it down. Um, what I would, I guess what I'm, where I am, I don't say total lockdown. What I say is be smart, you know, get us, get our numbers down and then school should be a focus if you can. And then open the, the most risky things last, but we've got to help the people. Like you can't just tell restaurants you can't be open. So there's got to be, you know, the government's going to step in and help. You can't just say, oh, well, you just will lose all our restaurants, right? So it's a really complicated problem. Um, I fall just short of saying lock it all down. Um, but I, again, I, there are groups that say that's the only way we're going to be able to, to do it and do it fast. You know, it's sort of like a short term, shut it down, you have a better chance. I'm, this is a long rambling, it's a hard question, but, um, you know, there's different ways you can do it. But the key is people have to listen to the recommendations that are being made and recognize um, we're all in this together. Uh, and then there's um, another question related to the distancing with the masks. What distance should one stay away from people not wearing a mask when you are wearing a mask? And I know that that might be different indoors versus outdoors. Um, Absolutely, you know, outdoors the air just dilutes so fast. We do we feel a lot more confident. We weren't sure at the beginning, you know, how you know because we weren't sure what the dose was that would get us sick. So at the beginning, we were, we were even worried about outdoors. It doesn't seem to be as much of an issue. Having said that, we need more studies on outdoors. We only have like two. Um, but you know, always no matter outdoors or indoors, but certainly indoors, the further apart, the better. Um, even with a mask, I just am very careful um, because what happens is it's like, think about it as cigarette smoke. Think about a cigarette smoker. You know, if you didn't want to smell their smoke, you'd just be further away. The concentration will dilute even indoors. It will dilute the further you are away. And so what you're trying to do is minimize the number that you inhale to reduce the risk of being infected. So distance is still good, even, even with both people wearing a mask. It's just will kind of lower that um, probability of getting getting infected. The other thing that's interesting is that if you get a low, there was there's a really cool study where there were two cruise ships. One required masks and one did not. And they came back and they tested everybody. And that was kind of an interesting experiment. They didn't just test people who they thought were sick, they tested everybody. And they showed that on the cruise ship that wore masks, 90% of the people had been infected, but had no symptoms. So it seems like if you get sick with a mask because you inhale less, it can redu also reduce um, the severity of disease. So there's another reason to wear a mask. If you're gonna get sick, um, to get a lower dose is also um, working in your favor. Um, and all, the other cruise ship, the cruise ship that didn't wear masks, there was like 50% that were sick and they were much, much sicker, much more severe. Sorry. Okay. And I know we're right. It's kind of at time. There is also a question about neck gaiters, if they're no worse than mask at all. I believe your colleague, Dr. Marr, has done some research on neck gaiters. What, what is your opinion on those? Um, if they're double, so there was a really bad study. The very first study that came out on neck gaiters that freaked everybody out was bad. Um, there's been a lot of bad studies on, on masks. Um, there's a lot, it's not as, it's kind of a fine art to do these studies correctly. Lindsay Marr is the guru. Um, there's a few people that I really trust. What she actually showed was if you wear a double layered neck gaiter, um, which is the more common one, and you wear it to where it really, you know, seals against your face, it actually works um, as well as just a, a, a double layer, triple layer uh, cloth mask. So they're not as bad, um, but you don't want just like, again, if you have this one layer and it's thin and you can breathe it through it really easily, you know, the easier, sadly, the easier you can breathe through it, the more risk, you know, more stuff is gonna get through to you as well. So multi-layer gaiters um, can um, be, you know, pretty effective. They're not as effective as, you know, a surgical mask with a, um, with a cloth mask over the top, but they're still, um, I think, I wanna say that the percentage that they filter is around, it's like 70 to 80% they'll knock out. Thank you. Um, and there is one last question that is, what in your opinion, why in your opinion do our politicians not issue a mask mandate? I know that's a complicated one. Yeah, um, I think 
our current, our new president is coming really close to that. Um, you know, he's asking everybody to wear a mask for, you know, what is it like a hundred days. Um, and so, you know, I think it's also, it's just, you know, what I've been told is just, how do you enforce it? You know, you'd probably just have people do the right thing. Um, it's the carrot or the stick. Right. And so, you know, um, I think people are just, they want people to just do it because it's the right thing to do. Um, that's the lot language that I've heard. That's why I'm fighting so hard to get people to understand how masks help you and help others. Like, it's not like, you know, people say, oh, it mask takes away my freedom. No, by you not wearing a mask, you're taking everyone else's freedom away because we're going to keep doing this. We could do this for another year or two if you keep, if we keep doing this yo-yo, right? So the sooner we shut it down, the sooner we work together and realize it's in the air, the sooner we can get our lives back. And that, you know, it's very doable. It's very fixable. We just have to get the message out and more clear than it is right now. And that's, that's I mean, I'm more hopeful now that that will happen. And it, it is happening now. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jack and Kim. Um, I think this is, uh, obviously you had a lot of questions. It's something that's on all of our minds. Uh, but uh, as I said at the beginning, I think that it's so interesting that the, the basic research that you do, uh, you, you apply every day to uh, marine problems, but it's also so important and so applicable. And uh, it's a great testimony, not only to Jack and, and Kim, but to all of the scientists at uh, UCSD who are doing work that is applicable to this problem, that they have jumped in with both feet and are contributing to the solutions. Thank you both so much. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. <laughs>